Today's scripture reading, Mark 9, 43 through 50. Print's getting smaller. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the enter life made than with two hands to, to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone has to be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in your have salt in yourself and be at peace with each other. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, as we begin this passage today, uh, when we went through the Gospel of Mark, we kind of touched on it briefly, but I'm going to go into a little bit deeper because um, like I think happens a whole lot, when we get to the hard saying, we just kind of skip over. And I actually skipped over the hard saying, just kind of mentioned it briefly. And so I want to get back to this. And having said that, uh, this passage is, is really kind of very sober. It's a very somber passage. Uh, we kind of get, I think, hung up on the kind of this the hyperbole here with the cutting off of various body parts. Um, but uh, Jesus is talking about something that's very, very somber, very, very sobering. And I think um, it's important to church we kind of revisit these things and talk about them. Uh, otherwise, what ends up happening, these important doctrines end up being, we don't reject them, we just don't talk about them, and then people stop understanding them. And so it's really, so for me today, we're going we're gonna to bring that up, no matter how hard it might be to talk about these things. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we uh, uh, look at this passage where Jesus talks about salt. Father, we are here to hear from you. Once again, we are here to, by the attentiveness of our hearts and our minds, to worship you and give you the glory you deserve. For if we honor you, God, we will listen to what your spirit is saying to us today. So, Father, we pray that the things that would distract us, that would um, take our thoughts elsewhere, the, the way that our minds might wander, our, our tired bodies, whatever it is, God, that you would strengthen that and uphold that, that we might give you every ounce of our being today as we worship you by hearing your word and endeavoring to apply it to our very lives, that we might be transformed into the image of the one who died for us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the context of this chapter in chapter 9 is really Jesus teaching his disciples about this idea of what it means to serve people and what it means to give your life for the sake of the gospel. And so in return, after Jesus tells his disciples at the beginning of chapter 9 how to serve and be a servant leader, what his disciples begin to do is talk about how great they are, right? who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. So they didn't get it. He's talking about serving others, lowering yourselves, and he, they're talking about how great they can be and who's going to be the greatest. So Jesus in verse 35 says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And so at that point, he begins to tell them about this, the dangers of thinking about themselves higher than they ought to. Because the danger is they will cause other people to stumble, and they will also cause themselves to stumble. And causing people to stumble and being aware of your own propensity to stumble and fall into sin should not be taken lightly. It's a very serious matter for someone who follows Christ. And so Jesus begins to tell them the seriousness of the matter, but also shows them that there is another way. There's a better way than exalting oneself. So the first point of this, verse 43 through 47 no human attempt at dealing with sin will ever work. Jesus has talked about this, uh, this uh, principle over and over and over again. And through hyperbole, he ex it really um, kind of slams it home to them. Because they're talking about human effort. Who's going to be the greatest? What can I do to be great in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus has to tell them once again that no human attempt at pleasing God will ever work. Verse 43. If your hand causes you to stumble... Uh, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands going to hell, where the fire never goes out. 
And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Some of your translations might have verses 44 and 46 kind of repeated there. Um, in most modern translations, those verses are taken out because they're not found in earlier manuscripts. They were added in later on to kind of give it more rhythm. So they weren't originally there. That's why they're not there in most Bibles, but yours might have it. So that's just a side note. So what Jesus is doing here, if you notice, he's not talking about specific sins. He's not saying, if you commit adultery, just do this. Or if you, if you lie, or if you steal, do this. He keeps the, 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 the types of sins very nebulous. So Jesus taught, so if the emphasis is placed on the choice to do the sin, the action, and the responsibility of the person, not the sin itself, that's why it's left vague. So Jesus is talking about this, this propensity we have to choose, to make a choice to do things that are in opposition to what God asks us to do. God says, believe in me and be saved. Trust me. We trust ourselves, and we try to do things and, and prop ourselves up. And so this idea of the hand or the foot or the eye, it really is a metaphor in the way our hearts um, align us to choose something sinful over something that is holy and righteous and good. And so he doesn't mention the specific points of what types of sins because he's emphasizing the choice to do the sin. It really doesn't matter what sin it is, right? Because all sins lead to death and separation from God. What the difference is, is when we, we stand before God and go, I've made this decision. I've made this choice to trust you or to trust my own works. And, and the disciples here are really in a danger of choosing their own works. They're comparing how great they are and what their status in, among the disciples might be. And so the, it's kind of like mixed teachings here that often confuse people. They're really not mixed, but they come across as mixed teaching. Um, so the word hell there, we'll talk about that in a second, means eternal punishment. And this idea of life or eternal life uh, is talking about heaven and eternal paradise. The kingdom of God there probably refers to when the kingdom comes in fullness at the end of time. So he, he uses a lot of metaphors, this, this idea of eternal death, eternal life, and the end of all things, the culmination of all things. So what Jesus is doing with this kind of these mixed metaphors, he's not trying to give a detailed description of eternity. He's not trying to describe what heaven or hell or the kingdom is like, um, or even this idea of the possibility of, can you go into heaven maimed? If I cut off my hand, will I be in heaven without a hand? Is that a possibility? That's not what Jesus is doing here. He's illustrating through hyperbole, how impossible it is to keep from sinning. It is impossible for a human being to have the power to stop sinning. That's why Jesus just previously talked about the need for his sacrifice on the cross. He just talked about that. And so if, if we could stop from sinning, there is no need for a sacrifice. We just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and do good. And Jesus has just taught his disciples I need to give my life for you because you can't stop sinning on your own. And they're talking about what can we do to be great and impress God. And so he's coming right against it with hyperbole. It is impossible. Even if you maim yourself, even if you disfigure yourself, nothing will be good enough for you to be perfect enough to enter into life. You can't enter the kingdom of God without being perfect, without sin. And so he's kind of emphasizing these teachings that he's taught them over and over again because they're still getting it wrong after being in the church for a year, for a year now at least. They still don't understand that the Messiah must die for the sins of the world. And they're talking about what they can do. And that's not far from what we can do. How often do you think in your head, today I'm going to you know, do really good so, I can, so God will love me more? Right? Do we have those thoughts? Right, how, how often... I mean, I just got to, you know, I'm going to do really good for God because I want God to be proud of me. None of those things change. God is, loves you consistently. God is prou proud of you consistently. God, you know, all those things we, that God feels and has towards us are consistent because that's who God is in his character. Nothing we can do can heighten that or lower that in Christ. And so the disciples weren't getting it. So it brings us to point two. The result of human effort, if they continue in this path, is eternal death. If you follow your own way, if you continue in that path of trying, trying to live up to some 
moral elitism, then the ultimate end of that effort, no matter if you end up being the best person in all humanity throughout all time, still means eternal death. Verse 48. He says, all those things, you'd be thrown into hell. And then he describes this place, this, this area, this, this realm called hell. Where, well, what's hell like? The worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. And that's the hard saying today. What is Jesus talking about with the worm that eats them will not die, the fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Most of us are familiar with you are the salt of the earth passage, very positive, right? This seems to be not so positive, right? You don't, do you want to be salted with fire in that context? So the word translated hell here um, is, is literally ten Gehenna. Um, there are three words in the New Testament that are used to, to, that we translate the word hell. So every time you see the word hell, it doesn't always come from the same Greek word. There are three of them. The first one is the word Hades, the Greek word Hades. It's comparable to the Old Testament word Sheol, which simply means the grave. It's the realm of the dead. There's, no, there's nothing about judgment that has to do with it. It's just simply the Greek term for the realm of the dead, Hades, Sheol, okay, Hebrew, Sheol. The other one is the, is the word Tataris. That's not a sauce you put in your fish, right? It's Tataris. It's the, it's the Greek idea of the, the place of torment for warriors that didn't make it, right? So it's not necessarily a Christian or a Hebrew idea. It's really a Greek idea of where judgment happens. So it's a, a, gen, a general term of place of judgment. And you have this area, this word for hell, which is literally ten Gehenna, which is the word, is the definition, the valley of Hinnom, right? It's the dump outside of Jerusalem in Jesus' time where animal carcasses and trash and waste were thrown. And they were constantly burning, and there was constantly decay and nastiness going on there. And so during the times of, of the kings of Israel, what happened in that valley was the kings would take their sons, and they would sacrifice children in that valley to the god Molech. Right? So it's always a place associated with sin. Kings sacrificed their children to a false god there. Uh, in Jesus' time, there was a big fire there, burning smoke, smell, nastiness. And so just to kind of give you some um, views, this is actually south of the old city of Jerusalem. That valley right there, you see, is part of the Valley of Hinnom. It's the Hinnom Valley. In the ancient times, it would have been a dump, right? There would have been constant smoky fire. This is like the old, if you're old enough, you remember when they used to like, burn stuff in the dump? It was just kind of the smoke constantly rising out of the ground. They'd bury it, and there'd still be smoke rising up from the fires. And, they, and that this kind of fire would pop up every now and then. That was kind of what was going on there. Um, another, next slide. Do you know what, anybody have any idea what that is? It's an archaeological site. It's actually from Carthage. There, are, there is one in Jerusalem, but it's not as well preserved as this. Every single one of those little pots here, pots, every single one, and there's literally, in Carthage, thousands of them, uh, burial pots for infants right, that were sacrificed to ancient gods. This is called a tophet, uh, children's burial area. And so this was pretty common in the ancient world, where they would sacrifice children to gods. This is what happened in the valley of, of uh, Hinnom. And so Jesus is referring to that because the people of Israel have this long-term association with the sin and the idolatry and judgment and fire and rot and decay and no one wants to go there and so um, needless to say the Jews of Jesus day considered this valley a cursed place it was a place of uncleanliness it was a place of impurity it was a vivid picture in their minds of what judgment was like and so in Mark 9, 48, when Jesus says, where their worm does not die, notice it's, it's personal. It's not where the worm, it's where their worm. It's a personal place of judgment. Uh, he's actually quoting from Isaiah 64, 66, verse 24. Um, this is the quote that Jesus is actually paraphrasing here. They will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me, again, in judgment, the worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched. And they will be loathsome to all mankind. And so Jesus is quoting that to give them a vivid picture 
of what ten Gehenna, what, of what hell, what judgment is like. And uh, those texts there, both that when you see worm, I don't really know why they translate it worm. Again, it's traditional translation. It really means grub or maggot, right? That's what the word really means. So it's this idea where an association where a dump where there's animal carcasses and maggots are running through them and, and things are being eaten and it smells and there's fires cropping up. And, but Jesus um, says that the worm that eats them will not die. It goes on and on. And the fires that burn them will not be quenched. It goes on and on. And so, Matt, again, Matthew 9.48 does not intend to teach there are literal, literal worms, you know, maggots in hell, um, or that worms live forever in hell, whatever that you might get out of that. It doesn't even necessarily teach about a literal fire. What, rather, what Jesus is teaching here is the fact of unending suffering in hell. This worm, this grub, this, this maggot never stops tormenting those that are judged. He's given a picture of something that is indescribable. Because we have, we, when Jesus talks about hell, we often associate that with unending fire, right? The lake of fire. But more often than not, in the New Testament, the way hell is described is like this. I'll just give you three. Eternal darkness, the outer darkness, the blackest darkness, also talks about the bottomless pit as well. So there's all these descriptions of this place where judgment eternally is happening. And <clears throat> what I think it's really describing is something beyond our human experience. Do I believe there's a literal fire in hell? Probably not. Do I believe there are actual worms in hell? No more than, do I believe there's eternal dark? I don't know what that means. All I think it means is separation from God is something that they associated with the, one of the worst places that you could experience. And Jesus is describing it. Then he concludes that, that pericope, that verse there, for everyone will be salted with fire. As if they got it wrong. He says, now let me straighten you out. You might be thinking some things about Ten Gehenim. For everyone, you need to understand, everyone that goes there will be salted with fire. Um, so to understand this, you need to understand how salt was used in the ancient world. Two ways salt were used still today. One is as a flavor enhancer, right? You sprinkle salt to enhance flavor. And the other one is as a preservative. In the ancient world, most of the time, salt was used as the preservative, right? There was no refrigeration. You couldn't throw things on ice or anything like that. So the way they preserved meat and other things was through salting it, right? And so Jesus uses salt here is that idea, the idea of preserving this idea of preserving property. So when Jesus says everyone will be salted with fire, you could translate everyone will be preserved by fire or in the fire. Again, it's this idea of you'll be in the fire, you'll be with the grubs, you'll be in hell, but you will be preserved. Don't you think that you'll be burned up and it will end? Don't you think that the worms will finish their meal and they're done? It is forever. You will be preserved with fire. That is so sobering. Salt preserves, though the worm eats and burns, though nothing is consumed. Um, there is no end to the torment. Understand this. There is no end to the torment in hell, whatever that is, whatever that looks like, when a person relies on their own efforts to be saved. It doesn't end. Um, despite what people teach about that people will be consumed and it will end. Jesus over and over and over taught about the unending punishment. Because you have sinned against an eternal God. And human beings are made in the image of God. You are eternal. And the question is, where are you going to live out your eternity? In the presence of God or separated from Him? The point of this passage, at this point, Jesus has really confronted them because they're arguing about their greatness rather than thinking about the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, in turn, is warning them of the danger they are in when they trust in human effort. Not only are they putting themselves in danger, but they're putting others in danger as well. So he needs to refocus them and help them understand where real greatness comes from, where real success comes from. And to help them with that, Jesus continues in this metaphor of salt. So he just said that salt is a preservative. You'll be preserved in hell. But there's something good about salt as well if it's used in the right way. So Point three is this idea of how can salt be unsalty? How do you have an unsalty salt? So Jesus kind of changes uh, 
the, uh, the, the thrust here, he's talked about the horribleness of this idea of being preserved with Saul. Now he talks about just because Saul preserves, it can also be a good thing as well. 50. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? What is he talking about? How can salt become unsalty? If salt becomes unsalty, it's not salt anymore, right? It's something else. So what is he talking about? Again, you have to understand what's happening in the ancient world because um, to us, we go when we buy salt, we go and pick it up the thing. It's in a little tub, and it's, and it's pure salt. In the ancient world, they didn't have pure salt. If you wanted salt, you would go to the mountain or to the Dead Sea, and you'd scoop up a pile of goop or rock, and you'd pull it off, and that salt rock would be salt and other impurities in it, you know, various minerals and sand and dirt and whatever is in there. It would just be this unpure rock of salt. And so in its pure state, it, it, it was rarely found in the ancient world. In its natural state, it was always mixed with other substances, right? So when he talks about salt, he's thinking about that mixed property salt, a rock that has salt in it, but also other properties. So as long as the proportion of salt in the mixture was high, it would serve the, the purpose of preserving things. But if you let that preservative out in the exposed to the elements where it would get moist, it would be rained upon, then the salt in that mixture would leach out. And all that would be left were the other minerals, the dirt, the soil, whatever else is left as the salt melted away. Uh, that right there is a typical. So the white stuff that's kind of floating on top, that's the salt. Underneath is simply a, a rock and, and dirt and various grains and other minerals. And that's what you typically find. And, but if it rained on that, the white stuff would go away after a while. It would leach away, and you'd be left with minerals, things that really don't have any use at all. And so it's, a, it's not a question that Jesus is asking, how can you make salt salt again? He's not asking them for an answer. It's a rhetorical question. You can't replace salt when you have leached it out. It's gone, and what remains is useless. So salt that eventually degrades to the point of being unable to preserve is useless. If salt does not have its ability to preserve, it is useless. And that's why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, kind of the same teaching adds this. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You lose the salt, what do you do with a pile of dirt that has minerals in it? You throw it out in the street and people just walk on it. People don't even notice it's there. It's useless for preserving anything. In Luke it says this, it is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. It, how useless do you have to be that you're not even good for a manure pile, right? That's pretty useless. Now Jesus is saying if you let the salt in your life, the good stuff, leach out, you're useless. So Jesus' point to his disciples, they are in the danger of being useless. His point is this. Do not make yourselves useless. Don't focus on something that you, you can't attain. You're not going to attain greatness by the, the path that you're on. You need to understand, follow me in my way. So he asked them to be salty. Don't render yourself useless. So what does it mean to be salty? What does it mean to retain your saltiness? Uh, there's a number of things, but I just want to focus on this. Number four, being salty has a lot to do with living out your greater purpose. To be a salty Christian, to not let the salt leach out of you, is really about living out your greatest person. So Jesus' last phrase brings us back around to Mark chapter 9, when his disciples are, asked, are talking about who's going to be greatest, they're worried about their position in God's kingdom. Jesus is concerned about the church reaching people. He's concerned about salvation. He's concerned about the kingdom being, uh, kingdom growing. He's concerned about their personal sacrifices to be servant leaders so they can lead other people into obedience and following the gospel. That's the purpose of their lives. They, they're trying to think of some other purpose. He's saying, no, 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 you're off focus. To be really salty, you have to, def to, to be about what I purposed in you. The defining characteristic of salt is to be salty. The defining characteristic of Christianity or a Christian is to be contagious with the gospel, right? And so if something so crucial to its identity can be lost, if salt can lose its saltiness, 
then therefore it's no longer good for anything. If a Christian can lose their, 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 their contagiousness, then they're really good for nothing for the gospel. You, you can't restore that. If you, if you let it leach, leach out of your body, can it ever be restored? And we have examples of that throughout the scripture where people are taken out uh, of the way because they lose their saltiness. And Ananias and Sapphira, right? They get the worldly. I'm going to support the gospel, but I'm going to keep some to myself. They, just in case things backfire, what happened to them? And we have examples throughout scripture. So believers... What Jesus is saying is you need to treat your role in the kingdom of God as crucial. It is what defines you. It's not secondary. If you're a Christian that puts the kingdom of God secondary in your life, in your work, in your family, and all those good things that God blesses us with, they're all good things. If those things are primary, the gospel is secondary, you are rendering yourself potentially useless for the gospel. It's a big, big danger to be in. Um, again, no less saved, right? You're still saved. That's not based on what you do, but useless for the sharing of the gospel. So what do we talk about in application? Jesus wants us not to stumble along or be a stumbler. He wants us to be salty. We do that by, number one, embracing our primary salty purpose. This is your primary purpose. This is why you are still alive. This is why you still exist now, no matter how healthy you are, how not healthy you are, how smart you are, how dumb you are. Wherever you are on the scale and the, and the, of humanity, where, however you measure yourself, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, this is your primary purpose, these things. Number one, share the gospel message. That's your primary purpose. That's why you're still here. Um, see, uh, sin is like... Um, you have a piece of meat and you leave it out and it kind of starts to rot, right? It will eventually rot the whole meat, right? But if something starts to rot, and if you know anything about preserving with salt, if you pack salt in it, cut the rot out, pack salt in it, the meat will be fine. It will begin to take on its preserving properties. See, but, but if we don't pack salt in it, then the rot will continue and it will eventually eat up the whole steak or whatever it is, and eventually it will destroy it. The gospel is the only answer to the rot in our world. There are good things that slow things down. It's, it's important to be have a good education. It's, it's important to have activity in the social realm. It's important to do acts of compassion to people. Those things are really important, and God tells us to do those things. But those things are just stopgap measures. You can be compassionate to someone who is broken, but if they don't come to faith, back to the first part of the sermon, right? So things are important, but not as important as the gospel. The gospel is the only answer to humanity's ultimate problem. It is the solution, ultimately, to everything. And that's why God has commissioned us with that primary purpose, to share the gospel. The second thing he's commissioned us to do is to live out that gospel message so people can see the results of what a gospel-centered life looks like. Have you ever experienced this? Yeah, maybe you're at work and people are at the water cool and they're talking about something, they're telling it, maybe a dirty joke, and they know you're a Christian, you walk up, what do they do? They stop telling the joke, right? Or if someone uses the Lord's name in vain, they notice you're there, they go, oh, sorry, they apologize to you, yeah. right? right? Have, well, why is that? That's because Christians, when they come into a place where there is sin, they tend to have this, this uh, salty effect, right? It tends to cast out the sin, for, you know, get rid of that... Um, that sin in that area, it keeps the meat from continuing in the rot. The pressure of, of a, the presence of a Christian helps keep that sin contained, albeit a small portion of time. But think about how that works kind of in God's plan, how the presence of the church and Christians as we live out our lives actually preserve things. That's why God called us in, in Matthew 5 to be the salt of the earth. We are his agents in purifying the earth, right? And again, to understand what it means to be an agent of purity to the earth. It's not going around pointing out people's sin and saying, that's bad, don't do that, right? It's by proclaiming the gospel, right? We don't take care of people's sin. Jesus does. We just point them in the right direction, right? That's how we purify. So like salt, we're to bring out the better nature of those around us, right? Uh, through how? Through self-sacrifice and service. We try to lift people up from their brokenness so they can see their need of a savior. We bring out the better in people where they can respond in faith because they see us 
acting like Jesus by living for them rather than for ourselves, by giving up our needs for the sake of others. And the result will be greater peace with each other and not arguing about things that really don't matter. Jesus implies that it can't happen in the world unless it first is practiced with the church family. Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. If you have salt among yourselves first, you'll be at peace among each other, and that peace will leach out, saltiness will leach out into the world and have that effect. So embrace your salty purpose. If it's not crucial and primary in your life, you're not living to the potential that God has for you. And that's, again, I said this before, that's why many Christians are miserable. Because they simply want to be happy, and they're trying to do things that make them happy in a worldly sense. And it might for a while, but it's never lasting. To be truly fulfilled and have the abundant life that God promises us is only found through living out who we are in Christ. Second thing I want to say as I close here, number two, be aware of the tendency for your saltiness to leach out. That's what happens to salt. It has a tendency to, to leach out. Salt cannot lose its saltiness. It won't be salt anymore. Jesus' point is, if the, there's a variety of purity of salt. You can have salt with a lot of salt in it, a lot of, some small amount of impurities, or vice versa. So stale salt um, is not effective. Pure, the purer the salt, the more effective it is. Um, the more diluted it becomes, the less effective it becomes. Right now, what Jesus is saying to his disciples, they risk having their salt leach out and their effectiveness being diluted if they allow the values of the world, like the love of authority, the love of power, the love of position, to suppress the saltiness that God desires. That's what leaches salt out when we focus on position, power, the things of the world rather than the things of God primarily. I'm not saying don't work, don't get an education. Those pursuits are noble and good, but they're not your ultimate purpose. They're your secondary purpose. And so Jesus ultimately explains that position and authority are not necessarily markers of how closely we follow him as the disciples believed. They thought, if I have power and authority, if I can lead people, that, that means I'm good with God. That's not the way it worked. That's what the Pharisees thought. Today, in our day, neither is success or outward spirituality. A little bit different today. We think we're close to God if we have success, if God blesses us, right? How, how often do you hear that? I'm just praying that God blesses me. That's okay, but if that's your level of success, if you're blessed or not, you're, you're going you're gonna to be sad. You're going to be miserable. Because sometimes the most happiest people in the world are those who aren't blessed very much. If you've ever been to a third world country, Christians in a third world country, that have absolutely nothing, are playing with sticks for yeah. toys, they are the happiest people in the world, not blessed at all with material things, and they're so happy, right? Oh, yeah. And we're like not happy if I don't get the new iPhone, right? We're just like miserable for months, yeah. right? And it's just, it's just so pitiful, and we have that idea that success and even outward spirituality are the markers of true Christianity. Have salt among yourselves, Jesus says, and be at peace with one another. The ability to bring out the best in others and bring peace is a much better test of how close you are to the Lord. If you walk into a place and people all around you are lifted up, if you walk into a place and dissension and, and, and brokenness dispel and peace comes, that's where the Christian is found. That's where it's found. Not, and I, don't, I don't care. Please read the Bible and pray and, and do your devotions. We're actually going to have a seminar on how to do that effectively in, in the fall. Do those things. But how much you do those things really has no bearing on how much you love God. Right? They really don't. I, mean, I, can, I, I can bring my wife flowers every day. Right? That really has no bearing how much I love her, does it? It just says I give gifts. Right? It's, that's part of it, right? And don't tell them to do that because I'm not. Um, she only gets them when she deserves them. <laughs> She's not here, so I can. Um, oh, this is being recorded. Hi, honey. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, what I meant to say, I'm going I'm to do wonderful things for her. But you see what I'm saying? It, it, uh, acts of, of goodness, they're fine, but they're not 
they don't matter alone. It's a whole picture. And what Jesus is saying here, have salt among yourselves. People are looking at us as the, as the children of God, as those who are saved, and they're saying, does the gospel bring the better out in people? Does the gospel bring peace to people? Does the gospel bring compassion to people? Does the gospel do the things that Jesus says it would? If they don't see us living it out, they're not going to respond to a message that in their minds is false because we live as if it is. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you trust us enough to give us your spirit that we can live in, in, the, in the power of his, of his power so that we can be salty in this world. Father, th there is a lot at stake. Uh, the reality of separation from you for all eternity is nothing to, to ignore. You talk about hell more than you talk about heaven, Jesus, in the scriptures. Uh, it is a reality. Though we might not understand exactly what it looks like and what the experience is, we know, God, that that's probably because the experience is beyond any human experience we can have now. Being removed to in, in total from your presence, from, from even the, the general grace that you pour out on the earth, is a very horrible and scary thing. But Father, you've given us a different way. You've called us to be your people, to, to, to be salt in the earth and to share your gospel and to live it out so people might see their need for Jesus, that they might not rely on their own works and their own goodness and their own um, accomplishments in life, but they might see their brokenness and cry out to you for a savior, for only the gospel, only your sacrifice, God, can, can restore the world. And one day it will. But one day every knee will bow and recognize who the real Lord is and what the real way to salvation is. Father, we pray that many would realize that before it's too late. And we pray, God, that you would use us powerfully in that process. That we would make the gospel and, and living out our, our salty lives a priority. That it would be crucial to us. That it would be our lifeblood. That all, all other things would fall by the wayside. That we would be like Jesus who's primary purpose was to give his life for the, for the salvation of many. And all along the way he healed people and fed people and loved people, took care of people. But that didn't divert him from his ultimate purpose, and nor should it us. Mm -hmm. Father, so help us to be compassionate and heal and be active in people's lives and making their lives better, but let us never forget that ultimately a human being's response to the gospel is the ultimate question we have to bring before. God, open our eyes to these things for your glory, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.